Without further ado, I would like to welcome our first speaker, James Bowden, is, who is talk is called About Braille Files. James joins us from the UK. He works at RNIB, Royal National Institute of Blind People, as a Braille technical officer, handling queries about Braille, and then is involved in various Braille-related projects, both in the UK and internationally. You can read more about James on our symposium webpage. A lifelong Braille reader, James is passionate about all things Braille. He is familiar with several Braille codes, including technical aspects of UEB, Braille music, and some foreign languages. But right now, he is going to talk all about Braille files. So James, thank you. I'll turn things over to you now. Thank you so much, Daphne, and what a wonderful symposium. Thank you once again for inviting me to speak. It's an absolute honour and a privilege, and uh, I hope this will be of interest to folks. So we're going to talk about demystifying some of the different types of Braille. What is 6.8. Computer Braille, literary Braille, all these terms um, what are Braille files? What do they actually contain? What, how do you make one, et cetera? What's, what, why would you want one? How, how do you navigate one? And finally, I'm hoping to touch on a new project, the eBraille project, which is kind of going into the future of Braille files. So to start with, I'm hoping this will all be really familiar to most of you, if not all of you. Most people who learn Braille use a six dot braille cell, three high, two wide, and learn either grade one or grade two, or as we sometimes say, uncontracted and contracted braille. I'll use those terms interchangeably. And grade one or uncontracted is letter by letter. You write every single letter out. And grade two, you add lots of interesting contractions as they're called to represent common letter combinations and common words. In English, the contracted Braille code reduces the size of the Braille by about 20%. And that means the fluent Braille reader gains a speed increase corresponding to that. Both grade one and grade two are meant for ordinary text words primarily and typical punctuation signs. And you could say it's therefore for literature and therefore we use the term literary braille. There's the first piece of jargon, literary braille. Covers grade one, grade two. And as we know, there are not special signs for capitals and numbers. So unlike print, we have the same sign for a capital A or a small a, or even a number one. And we have special prefixes, which go before that to say, this is a capital or this is a number. So a capital A is actually two braille characters in literary braille, dot six, dot one. And the number one is the number prefix, four, five, three, four, five, six, and then a dot one. I'm sure all of that is very familiar, but I'm mentioning it to contrast it with what's coming next. So traditionally, Braille has mostly been embossed onto paper, but it can also be shown on a Braille display. These are devices which typically raise and lower plastic pins to form a single line of Braille. Now I know there are nice new products in the, in the marking, marking uh, which will give us multiple lines, but for this, traditionally, they're one lines. You can almost think of a braille display a bit like a little braille screen. And traditionally, these have been used with computers and have been particularly useful when programming computers. Ah, there's a problem. If you look at a typical QWERTY keyboard, there's lots of interesting symbols like tilde, left brace, up arrow, backslash, vertical bar. And if you're programming a computer, you're almost bound to need some of those somewhere along the line. And the problem is, in traditional literary braille, 
some of those characters simply did not have a braille sign for them. They don't occur in literature. And there's another interesting thing about programming. In some languages, the layout of the code is very important. In some languages, it's absolutely critical. It won't work unless you get the layout right. So it would be nice perhaps to have a one-to-one -one print to braille kind of code. Okay, well, that's quite easy to program. If you're writing a screen reader, driving a braille display with a simple one-to-one -one code, say this print character, okay, it's those braille dots. This print character, okay, it's those braille dots. But we hit another problem. There are not enough unique six dot braille characters to do this for a computer. There are 63 different six dot braille combinations, 64 if you count the space. Um, I'll leave the mathematicians to work that one out. And the answer was to build an eight dot display. So instead of having three dots high, we now have four dots high. And the dots seven and eight go below dots three and six. So down the left, one, two, three, seven, and down the right, four, five, six, eight. And these bottom dots can be used for certain special characters. And they can also be used to show where text will be input, that is the cursor, and also can be used for showing highlights. So in eight dot braille, the basic letters, they're the same, but other characters use other combinations of braille dots, and they are not always related to the literary code. Because it's a one-to-one, -one, there are no prefixes, so no capital sign, no number sign, etc. You just use different combinations of dots. So for example, a lowercase a in eight dot computer code is dot one, no surprises. But a capital A is dots one and seven. So it's two dots and they're quite wide apart. If you're new to reading computer braille, be very careful of some of these characters. So for example, don't mistake a capital A dots one and seven for a lowercase k dots one and three. Now, eight dots, there are 255 different dot combinations or 256 if you count the space. And this really corresponds very well to the 256 possible characters that you used to have in traditional computing. You've probably heard the term ASCII. ASCII basically was a, a system of numbering characters to a computer. So computers, they store numbers and the computer would just interpret this number is that character and there were 256 of them. Now the USA computer code is related to the Nemeth code. So remember there are no prefixes in computer code, no prefixes in 8 dot braille. We have dots three, sorry, dots two, three, five, and six. They're used for the different numbers. So number one is dot two, number two is dots two, three, and so on and so forth. Plus is dots three, four, six. The period or full stop is dots four, six. But there are plenty which are not the same as Nemeth. The left square bracket, for example, is dots two, four, six, and seven. Well, enough about that. What about storing rail? So remember that this. 8 dot braille or computer code is a one to one mapping. So one character in the file is one braille character. So instead of storing a computer program, you could actually use exactly the same system to store a series of braille characters. In other words, braille text. 
The advantage is it doesn't take a great deal of space, certainly a lot less than storing the physical Braille volumes. So using computer Braille, ignoring the dots seven and eight, just ignore them, you can store any six dot Braille code in a computer file. And this has become known as a BRF file. Let's give you an example. The word beginning, written in contracted English Braille, dots two, three, G, dots two, five, sorry, excuse me, three, five, N, dots three, four, six, B, E, G, I, N, sign, N, ing, sign. Now, in the USA computer code, the numbers represent the dots two, three, five, six combinations. So number two, that's dots two, three, G, that's the same. Dots three, five, that's a number nine, N, and then plus is dots three, four, six. So beginning would be written in the file as two G nine N plus. It doesn't make much sense with a screen reader. It makes perfect sense when you read it on a braille display. So BRF files really just contain characters which represent braille dots, spaces, and new lines. You can store ready formatted pages of braille and they'll come out exactly the same when you emboss. You can also read them on a braille display or you could apply what's called a braille font and then a sighted person can read those dots as dots on a screen. The key thing is the encoding in the file and the font or the braille display or the embosser must match. It's just a file containing braille characters to a computer. You can store anything. It's just text. And therefore, you can store any pre-translated braille that you like. It could be contracted English. It could be French uncontracted. It could be a mixture of both. It could be mathematics. It could be partially contracted. Say you're halfway through learning the contracted braille code. You can store that in a BRF file. You can even do music. It's just lines of text to the computer. What happens is it gets interpreted as braille dots when it's displayed on your braille display or sent to your embosser. Now, many modern braille displays can store these BRF files either in memory or on a memory card or memory stick. And it's a really convenient way of having a whole braille library at your fingertips in a fraction of the space. Well, how about making these files? How do you make them? Well, in fact, as they're basically text files, just characters, spaces, and new lines, I guess I could mention the form feed character as well. Um, you can basically write one of these in almost any standard text editor even a word processor and then save as plain text. So in Windows, for example, you could use the notepad utility to write one of these things. Just remember that every character that you type was one Braille character, no contractions. If you type in T-H-E, you will get T-H-E in the Braille. You need to write in the USA computer code, for example, ignoring dots seven and eight, and you get out exactly what you write in. So if you typed in the figure eight, you will get in the braille dots two, three, six. If you actually wanted a braille number eight in the literary code, you'd have to type two characters into your BRF file. The first one is the number sign, and the second one is the letter H. To set your screen reader, if you're using one, to the USA Braille code, and hopefully it'll look very good. Just for interest, what about Braille transcription software? 
many Braille books and documents are created with Braille translation or transcription software. And these basically have a series of rules saying, if you see this, you Braille that under these conditions. And all these rules are collectively known as a Braille translation table. So I've got a few rules here. The letter O, okay, that's dots one, three, five, and that applies anywhere. Yep, okay, that's easy. Ah, but we have a problem. There's a contraction OU. Okay, so we better tell it that OU is dots one, two, five, six, and that also applies anywhere. Okay. Um, oh, hang on. There's a word out. That's dots one, two, five, six, but only if it's a whole word. And if you've got that, then what happens if you have the word OU? Well, that has to be written out. So that's a fourth rule we need to put in. OU is 135, 136. And that only applies if it's a whole word. And so you build up these, these list of rules. Now, that's incredibly incomplete. And I've deliberately picked only a few. Otherwise, I could be here probably for a few hours going through all kinds of rules and exceptions to rules and exceptions to exceptions to rules. And yes, they really are. So there are literally hundreds of these rules typically for English contracted Braille. And, you know, you computers are very good at running through lists of things and finding the best match and they can do it really quickly. And we kind of got used to that. Now, another part of the translation software will be what we call the formatter. And it will say, OK, I know that this part of the text it is a paragraph. So that means I need to put two spaces at the beginning of the first line. Or it could say, ah, this, this piece of text, that's a centered heading. So I need to put a load of spaces at the beginning to make it look centered. It's really quite easy because you just push spaces to make something go over to the right, and you just do new lines to make something go down the page. So we can store all these Braille files on a Braille display these days. How do you navigate one? It's just basically a plain text file. So really the answer is exactly the same as what you would do for a text file on your computer. You have arrow keys to move left, right, up or down. Some Braille displays have a command to go to the next or previous paragraph. Now that is a little bit fuzzy, but basically what they tend to do is they say, well, um, typical paragraphs start with a line which has got a couple of spaces at the beginning. So let's look for a line which is indented. That works perfectly well if you have an ordinary paragraph, but if your paragraphs are, say, 1-3 instead of 3-1, that is, the first line is not indented and all the other lines are indented, then, of course, it will not work quite so well. Some displays have a page up, page down command, but uh, that can also be a bit vague, especially if you don't have the form feed characters in the file. So it might just jump a thousand characters and hope. But the most powerful command that we have when navigating a BRF file is the find command. Typically, it's space and the letter F, and you press the two together. So it's space and dots one, two, four, press them all together, type in what you're looking for, and then press the enter key on the Braille display, which is very often dot eight on the right. Now, if you do this, you must match exactly what dots you're looking for. So if you're looking for a word like chapter and it's written in contracted Braille, you must use the CH and the ER sign. If you write C-H-A-P-T-E-R, even if the word chapter with contractions is there, it will not be found because it's not a translator. It's just a matching on those Braille signs that you write. So remember also to include capital signs, number signs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, find is great if you know what you're looking for. But if you don't, then there are a few 
general tips which may be helpful. First up, many books contain a contents page. So you can search for contents with a capital C and hopefully you can read what's in the contents page. That will give you a good clue how chapters are written or you could look for the chapter name or even the number of the page where that chapter starts. Do a second search and you go right to that chapter. Brilliant. Or if you want to just look for a chapter and move by chapter, you could look for the word chapter and maybe the number as well. You can search for chapter three or chapter four or whatever. But be careful. Some books write digits one, two, three. Other books will write Roman numerals I, 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 V. And other books might use words, O-N-E, T-W-O, T-H-R-E-E, etc. And the word chapter may or may not actually appear. You can get clues about this from the contents page and you can read up to the first chapter heading to find out what they're going to be like. Because if, if it reads just Roman numeral one on its own, the line that's centered, you can pretty much guess that the word chapter is not there and the rest of the chapter numbers are going to be written in Roman numbers as well. Next up, you can search for a new print page number. Now, in Ghana countries, the USA and Canada, new print pages are normally denoted by a long line of dots three six right across the page, immediately followed by the new print page number. So you could always search for 36363636 and then the number. In the UK, we use a different sign. We use dots five, dots two five and the number. Either way, you can jump to a new print page. But bear in mind that a section that you're looking for may not always start at the very top of the page. So you might have some reading still to go. Also bear in mind that some automated systems in particular may not use those standard conventions, the lines of dots, three, six, et cetera. They might, for example, put new page numbers just in square brackets. Lists, you could search for a bullet point, dots, four, five, six, dots, two, five, six, or even a number preceded by some spaces perhaps. Tables, now there's an interesting one. Some tables might have a transcriber note at the top describing the column headings. So you could search for the sign for a transcriber note, which varies depending on your braille code. It's not an exact science, any of this, but you can, you can try these tricks and see which work for you. You could look for any old heading, just by typing a load of spaces and a dot six. Most headings will start with a capital, so uh, that might well work. One I like, you could search for the number of a hymn in a hymn book. Assuming each hymn starts with a centered number, you could search for several spaces and then the number of the hymn. Recommend at least four spaces to avoid finding things which are just a number or a capital sign at the beginning of an ordinary paragraph or a side heading. Important to remember that the find command normally starts looking at from your current position. So if you're in chapter seven and you want to find the beginning of chapter four and you're looking forward from seven, you're not going to find it. So you have to go to the top of the file first if you're going backwards, or indeed there might be a command to search backwards. Now, there's another interesting trick. Some braille displays might have book notes, sorry, bookmarks that you can use. And that's particularly useful, for example, when you're reading footnotes. So you reach the footnote reference, you set a bookmark where you are, you search for the section called footnotes, if there is one, and then you look for the footnote number, you read the footnote text, 
you go back to your original bookmark and you can continue reading just where you left off. Footnotes might be indicated by a superscript or an asterisk number. There are several different ways. Might all sound daunting, all of this. And yes, there are quite a number of tips and tricks that you can try. And sometimes it requires a bit of patience. What about the future? Well, there's a new project and it's called the eBraille project. It's under the auspices of the American Printing House under the DAISY Consortium. And it aims to try and hopefully fix some of the limitations of BRF files, like all these interesting tricks you have to use to navigate. There are representatives from Braille organizations all around the world and meetings are happening very regularly and it's really interesting to see how things are developing. So what are some of the advantages of eBraille files? I've picked out a few. I'm sure there are others. So in no particular order, first one is tactile graphics. Currently, if you're producing a book, the tactile graphics have to be produced completely separately. And then you have to, in the production process, include those tactile graphics in the right places, between the right pages, and it leads to more complex production etc. It's hoped that the eBraille file will be able to contain the tactile graphics just as you can insert a picture into say a Word document or a PDF file or a web page. So hopefully be able to include tactile graphics in an eBraille file as well. Now for those Braille displays which cannot display graphics should also be able to have alt text, just like, like we would in a Word document or a web page. Some of you may have been to the CSUN exhibition earlier this year, and you might have seen the Monarch device being developed by Humanware. And it's a, a, a device able to show both Braille text and Braille graphics on one surface. We eagerly await to hear of future developments. Now, the next one I'm going to talk about, I call it reflow. So assume you have a BRF file and it was originally written for a line length of 40 characters, which is typical for hard copy Braille, particularly in States and Canada, I understand. Now, this may or may not be an issue on your particular Braille display. But assume your Braille display has only got 32 cells, not the full 40. Or maybe it only has 20 cells, not the full 40. What happens? Sometimes you get what I call long line, short line syndrome. Sounds like a horrible medical condition, but actually it means you get one long line and then one little tiny bit left over. And it's very uncomfortable to read and it wastes a lot of space if you try and emboss it. Now, I've actually written uh, a couple of sentences here. Actually, it's less than a sentence. It's a few lines. And I'm going to try and read it. And I'm going to say when I'm pressing the advanced button on my Braille display. It was the right wap. Try again. It was the white rabbit, comma, trotting, new line, slowly, new line, back again and looking anxiously about as it, new line, went, comma, new line, as if it had lost something. And she heard it, new line, muttering, new line, to itself. You can tell it was very irregular to read that. And you really can't get into a nice Braille reading rhythm when you get this long line, short line problem. Now, eBraille hopes to be able to let the Braille display reflow the text to the available space. So even if you have a, a whopping 80 cell Braille display, you'll be able to use all available cells for the text, for ordinary text. Now, of course, there are cases 
where you do want a particular layout and hopefully that will be accommodated as well. Now, what about internationalization? We've talked about the USA computer code as the basis for BRF files, and that's the code used in most English speaking countries. But around the world, there are lots of other Braille codes. And the problem is the letters tend to be the same, but all the other signs will vary. So if, for example, I got a piece of Braille music from Germany and tried to read it on my English Braille display, all the letters would be the same, but all the other signs would be completely different. And the whole thing becomes rather unreadable very, very quickly. Just to give you an example, the percent sign in the US encoding is dot 146 or SH sign. If I was in France, percent would represent dots 3468. And in Germany, it would be all six dots. So, you know, if you had a, a file from one of these other places, you'll soon find incorrect dots and you think, I just can't read this. I wrote the phrase on account of the weather in grade two Braille, and I put it in a different Braille table. I got the following dot two on space a sh sign dot three t lower h dot five w c h dot five r t h sign. It makes no sense at all. You really have to have the right tables, and that is a source of big frustration, particularly in countries where they don't use English. Now, eBraille hopes to solve this one by having a single standard encoding for Braille dots, and it's proposed to use the Unicode Braille patterns. And the last one that I'm going to talk about, navigation. We've talked earlier about all those wonderful tricks that you might need with the BRF file. eBraille hopes to include information about what kind of thing each bit of text is. So this bit of text, that's a paragraph. This bit of text here, that's a heading. This here, that's a table. And then the idea is hopefully we might be able to use something a bit similar to the quick navigation commands that we've become used to with screen readers. So hopefully you might press a button and go straight to the next heading or press another button and go, oh, I don't know, straight to a contents page or straight to the next table, etc. eBraille files can also contain links. So let's assume you were in a contents page. You could make all the different items in that contents page into links, click a button, and instead of having to manually find chapter five and then press enter, you can just click one button and you go straight to chapter five because it's a link. Similarly, for footnotes, instead of having to find the footnote section and find the number, you can just press the button on the footnote and go straight there. When you've read it, press a back button, a bit like you might do in a web browser, and you're back exactly where you started. Now there's much, much more still to do, but hopefully these will offer some very exciting possibilities. The vital thing to make this work is that equipment manufacturers, translation software houses, and braille production agencies all support the new standard when it's ready. We're currently at the technical design stage, and if you like things like acronyms and lots of interesting tags and symbols, that's the place to be. If you want to find out more about eBraille, you can go to the DAISY website, that's www.daisy.org, look for projects, and then Braille file formats. And there's all sorts of information about the project, including how to find out more and how to get involved. Now, that's all I want to say, but I'm sure there are lots of questions. Thank yes. you. Yes.
Wonderful, James. Thank you. You've given us lots, lots to go on. Uh, we'll have a just a very short period of time for questions. Um, please raise your hand and we will go to them. Thank you. Thank you, James. And if anybody doesn't know on the computer, it'll be Alt Y or Command Y and on the phone, star nine will raise your hand. I am, oh, there we go. Uh, Debbie Brown. So Debbie, you might be muted. You might have to unmute with Alt A or Command A if it's a Mac. Okay, am I there unmuted now? Yes. All right, there we go. Um, I'm a little worried about, you know, we have all this wonderful old Braille that we've all done. And, and I'm sure there's gonna be some way of translating and some of them, some of it'll be a little rough because you're guessing at formatting and all that. Um, you know, and we've all used it the, you know, in the US we've used the ASCII table and that's probably translatable. So I, how easy it going to be to get our old Braille into uh, um, EBRF formats? A really good question there. And I know it's something that APH has definitely been considering. As I said, we're still at the technical design stage, so I can't actually give you an answer how easy it will be but certainly it has been mentioned. Peg Mercer. Oh, thank you very much. Um, this wonderful presentation. Just a quick question about the eBraille um, project. Um, <clears throat> for the find navigation, finding things, would, would there also be the um, capacity for it to include like level search by level or search by, I think you did say search by heading. Yeah, search by level and the various things that you can do in a daisy book. So you're, yeah. you're specifically referring to different heading levels, I guess. Different heading levels. Uh, yeah, and because sometimes a, a chapter may, <clears throat> may not be indicated by chapter one or whatever, it may just mm. be a break. Mm. So sometimes I think that's shown as like level one or you know, some yeah. of these doozy books we have on our audio players have th two or three different levels. That's right. Yeah. That's so right. I'm just wondering if, yeah. So eBrown is currently looking at six different levels of heading. Oh, and okay. assuming that you have the quick navigation functionality on your on your on your braille reader or whatever, um, then hopefully you'd be able to either jump to any level, ever, any level of heading or mm -hmm. a specific level, just as you can with the quick navigation on your screen reader. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any last questions for James? Oh, we have a question in the chat here. When is it appropriate or better to use eight dot braille? That's a really good question there. So traditionally, um, when we were in the land of standard English Braille and English Braille American edition, some of the signs simply did not exist in those codes that you need for computing. Now, the eight dot Braille was primarily devised for computing and programming specifically. So if I had a line of, for example, C code, you know, if open bracket, A square bracket, I plus J, close square bracket, vertical bar, vertical bar, it's complete gobbledygook in terms of language. Um, but if you if you know this, the, the code, it makes perfect sense. Um, the, the computer code was great for that kind of stuff, especially as there weren't those symbols in the previous literary codes. Now the distinction is a little bit harder because there are specific signs. Um, so it is kind of slightly personal preference nowadays. Um, if you like the one-to-one -one mapping, you like no contractions, then go for the eight dot code if you like it. Otherwise you can go for the six dot code. Personally, I do use both depending on what I'm reading. 
Well, thank you very much, James. I don't see any other questions, so we can wrap it up there. But I'd like to thank you on behalf of Braille Literacy Canada for being here and for sharing all this with, with everyone.